Hi, I'm Brad Power, and I'm the moderator of this weekly meeting of the Prostate Cancer Lab. Today, our focus is going to be a continuation of a conversation that we started about the standard of care roadmap for advanced prostate cancer. Uh, and Rick shared in a previous meeting a one page summary he had done of the NCCN guidelines. Uh, that's a National Comprehensive Cancer Center, I think, or consortium uh, network. Um, and uh, he had identified some place at a point where there was a lot of flexibility, shall we say, or discretion and the advanced, very advanced stages. And one of his initial thoughts was how could that be more structured or um, guided, influenced by uh, some testing. And then we have also talked a lot about bringing testing forward in those guidelines uh, to help people at each decision point. And also uh, Saeed has talked about making it more dynamic and we've also talked about putting a strategy on top of it. And we've talked about uh, embedding more real world evidence in the decision so that people could understand the outcomes. And Saeed has suggested we could make it more predictive. Uh, so a variety of ideas we've been coming up with to enhance the standard of care guidelines. So we're gonna pick up that conversation today and carry it forward. Rick's going to kick it off by sharing some of the where we were before and uh, a couple of ideas he has, but then just open it up for conversation. Uh, Rick or Brian, anything you want to add before we before we launch into that? I'll kind of give a, a pre prelude to what I'm about to present in a PDF form. Uh, I'm on my I'm Friday will be my eighth round of chemo. I am currently, to my awareness, stable. Uh, my PSA is 2.4, and I have nodal disease. So I have uh, four or five lymph nodes in my upper body from neck, middle of my chest, pelvic regions that are lighting up on a PSMA scan. Uh, subsequent scans, uh, not PSMA, but <clears throat> Now that the uh, pathologists know where to look, uh, and the interpretation is they aren't these nodes, uh, lymph nodes are not growing, and the interpretation from the uh, stable PSA, uh, which went down from 3.6 down to uh, uh, 2.4, and it's stable at 2.4. So my current assessment is stable disease. Keep going on chemo. Uh, rounds eight, nine, and 10, if, if possible. So just thought I'd say that's kind of my current state. And then what happens after rounds uh, 10? And that's what I'm going to uh, discuss, you know, like how could we bring some molecular evidence to guide the next treatment? And how, do, how does that influence, if, it, if at all, uh, my oncologist's guidance. So that's kind of what I want to talk about. Brian, let me uh, uh, open it to you. I don't want to, you know, talk too much without your input. No, I think that's a that's a great place to start, Rick. Um, and I'll add color um, as you go. Okay. Uh, thanks. Okay. Well, uh, I'll share my screen and. Um, hopefully everyone can see it. Yeah. Okay, so this is, um, I'll kind of start with maybe where we left off or just to reinforce, uh, this is my interpretation of the NCC uh, and guidelines and the decisions. So, and, and again, uh, purple is Brian and I both have this shared journey. Um, our I'm in uh, red, Brian's in blue. So this is the um, standard of care that we've gone down. So uh, prostate was removed, but PSA is not uh, zero. We went on uh, you know, hormone um, 
therapy uh, by colutamide and uh, lupron, and we also had radiation still um, rising PSA. So we've gone, uh, we're going through the guides, which uh, guide or the recommended treatment. And uh, Brian has had on abiraterone, and I don't know whether, you know, I should put this at the second line or here, but either way, uh, he's gone from the bicalutamide to the aptalutamide to abiraterone and uh, also docetaxel, where I'm on and he has had. Um, so I just kind of wanted to say, okay, here's the guidelines and, and reform that. Is there any questions or anything? Because we're going to go farther next because what's after these guidelines? In, any questions? Hey, Rick, guess you hope my microphone is picking up well enough. Uh, the main thing when I looked at the NCCI guidelines, you know, my prostate was not removed. I was immediately stage four. So you kind of have to really search and look as to where the starting point is on that. Just a comment. So, Yes. Yes. And a good comment. You know, I, I had to pick a place. Um, absolutely agree. Uh, so you have to kind of fit in, you know, everyone's. So that's, that's the part of the problem with trying to condense 60 pages into one page. You're not going to capture everything, but uh, I tried. <laughs> okay. Rick, I think it's probably, a, uh, Mike, that's a good point. Um, I think that uh, that's a branch that we could that we could add to it probably pretty mm -hmm. easily because it will dovetail yeah. into a lot of what you see here. Good, good point, yeah. Okay, so the second slide, um, let me see if I can move this guy over. Um, these are on the right or on the left is the same information, same tree. And then after um, that's uh, guidelines, uh, a lot of oncologists are recommend, my oncologists all recommended that I look into clinical trials. And so uh, the classes of clinical trials or immunomodulators, uh, the targeted antibodies, vaccines, this is and you know other degraders. So there's a general class, whether you're going to personalize neoantigen or you're trying to do a, the, the big one, of course, is the PD, PD-1, PD-L1 uh, axes of intervention uh, because of the tremendous hope, hope there. But these are the classes of clinical trials right now. So, um, and then here are <clears throat> some of the tests or assays that would support which clinical trial you would go on. So uh, there's IHC, which stands for immun immunohistochemistry. Uh, and you would determine, uh, you know, whether you might be a candidate for uh, pdl one uh, So that would inform this decision. Uh, and you would look at, you know, basically, um, your T cells, do you have T cell inf infiltration into your tumor? If, if so, uh, the thought is that you uh, have T cells that would be able to uh, help kill the tumor if they were uh, not inhibited by the program death lig ligand one, PDL1. Uh, so that this is one type of testing and this is pretty typical. And then DNA sequencing, this will inform all therapy classes below. And RNA-seq, all therapy classes can be informed as well. And then some of the more cutting edge is spatial analysis, where you take a slice of the tumor and you put in uh, different, there's different techniques, but one of uh, the more advanced and exciting is uh, immunofluorescent, you would tag antibodies to uh, basically these type of immunomodulators uh, so that you could actually see the presence of different uh, proteins in your tumor. And based upon that, you would be able to choose some immuno, you know, which, which of these uh, clinical trials might be a good fit for you. And then uh, organoids, uh, this is, 
cutting edge, very, you take a little bit of tumor, grow it up, uh, replicate it into say 200 uh, little colonies and query it, query those 200 with uh, different uh, therapeutic candidates to see what kind of response you get. Uh, so these are kind of like some of the more advanced uh, assays that people don't typically get that might help inform this decision. So we're trying to be out here kind of a little bit on the, you know, push the cutting edge. So is there any, I'm gonna go into what assays have been done on me next and what, what it means to me and my uh, oncology care team. But I mean, is there any questions now? This has been kind of a little bit of a review and now I'm gonna go into um, how this generalization is working in Rick and Brian to a degree. Any questions? I, I think it'll be more clear when we start going in uh, to, you know, what does this actually mean? So here we go. Uh, so this is a screenshot of uh, my gen genetic testing, DNA sequencing. Uh, I was determined that I have two CDK12 mutations <clears throat> and uh, they are targetable. So this mutation has FDA approved drugs um, and uh, laparib uh, for uh, prostate cancer. Okay, I have low tumor mutation burden. Uh, MSI is microsatellite status is stable and I have a gene fusion. So this is the highlight of my you know, report. So this is kind of cool because I would have never known that you know, maybe I have a, a drug that is approved, an FDA approved drug that might help me. Would never have known that if it wasn't for this uh, DNA sequencing. And this is within the NCCN guidelines because they, they do recommend testing and they're testing for these DNA repair genes and CDK12, ooh, CDK12. So I, I have a specific mutation. It's not the same as Brian's, but uh, definitely handy to know that uh, from this report, I have an increased prediction of response to a laparib and the PDL1 blockade. The reason uh, is just statistically, uh, CDK12 mutations are a poor prognostic and they happen in about 5% of uh, prostate cancer patients. And it's known that uh, this, this type of uh, mutation will create a lot of gene fusions, which can be a target for T cells, which will attract T cells, hopefully. And therefore I would uh, hopefully uh, be responsive to PDL one So this is what, this is the highlight of my DNA sequencing report. I think it's pretty cool uh, because it did shed some light. I know, I know what's driving my cancer now at a genetic level. Any questions? And th this information is being considered by my oncology care team and is part of my next treatment beyond you know, standard of care. Actually, we're, this, this report is still in the guidelines. It's in the, the, the right most box of the guidelines. Uh, okay. Is there any uh, information about using this drug, for example, for CDK, CDK12? Is there any? Yeah, well, there's a lot of publications. It's a fair bit of publications. Um, and the outcome uh, of using. It's, 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 it was more hopeful upon approval, and as more data was released, uh, there's a weaker linkage of, uh, you know, in, improved outcome as time went on. So it's still, this is not maybe the first 
a uh, drug that my uh, care team uh, would consider, but it's, it's something. As I talked to Dr. Tanya Dorf, she said, I see Olaparib in your future, you know, one way or another. You could take it sooner, you could take it later. This is a drug that could help you. And when you exhaust other options, you're probably going to try it. And that's what I know about it. Rick, given our recent conversations with uh, Saeed, Dr. Gatby, Dr. Laird, all promoting the notion of combinations and lower dosages, mm -hmm. are you thinking of this as a monotherapy or are you thinking this as like, this might be in the next cocktail that I try? So how are, how are you thinking about that given what we've been learning? That's a great question. And it's not even me, it's uh, Tanya Dorf. Uh, who is one of the authors of the NCCN guidelines, is, and she's a City of Hope, so well-respected leader. Uh, she told me of a clinical trial <clears throat> at City of Hope that was a cocktail of Olaparib, a PDL one inhibitor, and a CTLA-4 inhibitor. So uh, those are uh, you know, FDA-approved um, immunotherapies, but the trial is to have a, the triplet cocktail. So that was her recommendation to be considered. She, she felt like a laparib on its own uh, had a weak response, but in the cocktail, uh, that's the hope of the uh, clinical trial, that the triplet would uh, extend my life. Yeah, and I guess given building on it as well, in the discussion we had about the cure match report, it would be interesting to see how that cocktail of three would overlap and give coverage to the biomarkers you've identified that are unique to you. Yes, I mean, this is going to get very interesting uh, upcoming <laughs> uh, because I would like to give um, this information to cure match, I did, and Ali told me, there's not enough here for cure match uh, algorithm to match. Uh, as we recall, uh, Brian's Tempest report included a little section of overexpressed genes, and that is a uh, CLIA approved um, assessment. And my report didn't. And, and upon asking the bioinformatics team at Tempest, they said, yeah, we don't always include it. Okay, so uh, anyway, I'll, I'll get into that more where I'm hoping to uh, do my own assessment of overexpression or, you know, pull together uh, the great work at uh, TGen and, and other uh, places. I look for a consensus where I could say, uh, I'm also overexpressing these genes and provide that to Ali. And then we can compare what her rec what cure matches recommendation would be to, you know, what does my uh, care team recommend and, you know, what are the options? So it should get pretty interesting uh, soon. And, and then the other dimension is we've been talking and, and you included the organoids. I just came off of a Society for Functional Precision Medicine webinar where they were talking about running tests on organoids. So it'd be awesome to take the, that cocktail, have an organoid, and as soon as, you know, again, this is all timing. I think there's, there's with the organoids, it seems like there's some lead time. It can take months to get the organoids cultured and all set up. So I guess thinking about that, um, do, you, do you need, do, I don't know, uh, and Brian, you've talked to S Engine, I guess, uh, what kind of tissue do they need to culture an organoid so that you could test? Is it fresh tissue or is it, is, you know, and do you have fresh tissue available that could, whatever the feedstock is for organoids, is that, is that available to you? So I, I don't know what is required. Uh, I have uh, fresh frozen at City of Hope for my primary. Uh, I don't know if that's good enough or whether they need fresh. Un I don't know that. Yeah, they, 
they need I, <clears throat> they need live fresh frozen is I believe the the okay if it the if status it can be need. frozen then uh, but but it's not just it's not just like and I don't know the I don't know the difference here there's like fresh frozen and there's live fresh frozen I'm not exactly sure and I think it's got to be shipped within 24 hours whatever I see. Um, mm -hmm. so it's I I got the sense it's pretty time sensitive. Wife's phone. <laughs> okay, let's keep rolling. So this was uh, my first re um, report. Um, it's from a scion who uh, used, uh, who was um, given this, uh, basically they subbed to TGen. Um, so City of Hope, TGen to a scion. Uh, that's who produced this report. And I only note that because I have a similar report from Tempest, which agreed. Um, so that's nice. Okay, moving on. I wanted to uh, go to immunohistochemistry. So there was, this is the, so we've just done molecular testing at the DNA level. Now I'm going to go uh, at the immunohistochemistry level. Then I'm going to go to the RNA-seq level. Those are the sets of data that I have. So uh, this was on my primary tumor, immunohistochemistry. It means uh, you stain a, a slice of the tumor tissue and, and you look for something. And in this case, uh, maybe it's fairly common for a pathologist to look for tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which are T cells and B cells. And my result was zero to 5% TILs. And that's not as good as we were hoping for because um, my mutation on average does attract these tills and the, the T cells are what kills um, your, your immune response that actually t kills the cancer. So having no T cells or, or zero to 5% is you know, not, uh, a good predictor of a response to uh, immunotherapy uh, on the PD1, PDL1 blockade. So, here uh, from Wikipedia, TILs are implicated in killing tumor cells. The pre presence is often associated with better clinical outcomes. So, I would have hoped for a higher number. So, that's my second bit of molecular testing, which uh, changes. And, and it changes between the primary tumor and uh, metastases, especially as metastases are being pushed by uh, therapies and chemotherapies. Uh, one would hope that uh, if a similar uh, IHC stain would be done on uh, one of my metastases, one would hope that we'd see some tills in there. So that's my next set. And then getting a little, I'll open up for questions, but just to, so people can kind of see uh, in case you don't, haven't had experience with looking at uh, CD3 staining. Here's the slice of tissue and it's a lymph node biopsy. This is from a paper in cell. Inactivation of CDK12, that's my mutation, uh, delineates a distinct immunogenic class. So. Why do we care about this? You know, if you look here at uh, the response of this per person who's in this paper noted MO1975, they were given a PDL1 or PD1 inhibitor. Their PSA was at, uh, you know, five. And when they were given the uh, PDL1 inhibitor, it basically went to zero. So it's a tremendous response. And the rationale was, here's the stain. CD3 uh, is um, a protein that is present on T cells. Uh, so you can look at this and where the brown is, you'd say there's T cells in here in, in this person's tumor and, and similar here. And then, you know, here's the shrinkage later on. 
but okay, the, the idea is, okay, the T cells are in the tumor. This person is a really good candidate uh, for uh, PDL1 blockade. Now, interestingly enough, these I don't have the, the uh, images for these guys, but they didn't respond. But the, these guys did. So this is kind of a, the first easiest look at will you respond or not? Should you waste your time with PDL1 uh, blockade or not? And so one would, although City of Hope pathologists did not share the image with me, which I wish they would have, uh, all I got was zero to five percent and no evidence of PDL1. So uh, one would think that my tumor would look like this without the brown um, stain from uh, CD3. So that's the result is uh, probably from the ev from molecular evidence, I'm not going to respond to PDL1. So. Any questions there? I'm going to go to RNA seq next. Just a question, um, uh, Rick. How would we reflect this on the roadmap? So what you're saying is, if I yeah. have an IHC stain for this stuff, then it's going to tell me I, I'm unlikely to respond to immunotherapy. So at some point, we're going to want to go back to that roadmap and uh, build in these if-then-else uh, right. kind of right. logic gates. So a uh, great question. Um, notice that um, Pembro, which is a, PD a Pembrolizumab, is a PDL1 um, blockade, or you know, it, 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 I forgot whether it's PD1 or PDL1, but uh, back in the roadmap, there are some uh, incorporations of molecular testing to whether to include it. So one is MSI, microsatellite uh, instability high or uh, mismatch repair genes. Uh, so from DNA testing, you would pick this, but the roadmap doesn't have a decision point relative to IHC staining yet, to my awareness. There's no nothing in NCCN guidelines that currently says, okay, if you test, uh, do an IHC stain um, and you test positive, you should go on a PDL1. Now, this is, this is a little interesting because uh, lung cancer for a long time, uh, you know, uh, chemo was the first line or one of the first line treatments. And then uh, when this PDL1 blockade came out, mm -hmm. now if, if you have lung cancer, you will be stained most likely for uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And if you, if a pathologist scores you above a threshold, um, the immunotherapy replaces chemotherapy as the first line therapy. So it's happening in lung cancer, uh, probably not so much in prostate cancer because uh, most prostate cancer primary tumors are cold, known as cold, meaning, uh, not a lot of uh, immune infiltration. Did that answer the question okay? Not really on the guidelines yet, <laughs> but it is influencing my care team's decisions. And so when I go through the RNA-seq, you know, my final slide will be, okay, here's what uh, Tanya Dorf, Raina McKay, and John Shen are recommending for my next options after chemo. And, you know, Hopefully that's of interest to all prostate cancer patients, this kind of journey. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm not hearing a lot of questions, so I think it's, uh, this is probably pretty clear to most folks. Okay. So then uh, I'm going into RNA-seq. So this is the re one of the neat things about RNA-seq is it's pretty cheap. Like if you send a, way your tissue to be sequenced uh, in a DNA sequencing lab, they probably run RNA-seq. And that's, uh, R that's RNA sequencing instead of DNA sequencing, you're getting the relative ab abundance of um, 
gene expression at the RNA level. Okay, and then uh, this is a preliminary data. Uh, this was uh, kind of a one view uh, of what a scion produces RNA-seq data. And then Tempest also produced RNA-seq data on me. And I, I wanna thank Josh Bell and uh, TGen Wei. Uh, thank you. Uh, Wei, I think you're on the call. And uh, Wei uh, provided yes. code. Yeah, full credit, you know, you provided the code. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you guys are interested in uh, learning how these uh, work, I, I can show a few slides, but it's very simple just to explain why the molecular uh, profiling helps to uh, deconvolute the cellular composition in the tissue. Yeah. I think that'd be fantastic. Um, if you wanted to take a few minutes and do that, that'd be great. <laughs> yes, yeah, very simple, just a few slides. Uh, well, hold on, let me share my screen. Fantastic. Um, sorry. Uh, so uh, the idea is very simple that uh, because for RNA seq we can get the whole uh, transcription or the expression, uh, gene expression values of the whole transcription because these signals are the uh, uh, convolution, uh, the, the uh, signals, because multiple, uh, mar multiple cellular can contribute to uh, one gene uh, signals. So we need to do deconvolution. So uh, there's a tool called uh, exactly immune deconvolution. So which help us to 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 uh, input the inputting the the gene expression values and uh, uh, out, output the fractions of the immune cells uh, and tumor cells. But uh, there's some assumption of what uh, could be in uh, in the tumor. But mostly they are uh, these kinds. For example, like these uncharacterized cells, usually they are tumors because the tumors are not normal cells. They call it uncharacterized, but for other cells, mostly myeloid uh, lineage uh, cells and the lympho uh, lymphoid uh, cells, which including T cells, B cells, and something like uh, neutrophil macrophages. That's how we can get the get the fractions of those cell types. And uh, I uh, so this just uh, one algorithm uh, because it's based on different assumption. Of the, uh, of the algorithms, they give the, for this case is uh, actually Rick's uh, case. You can see the, the other patients are, we, we just uh, pull out the expression, uh, uh, the transcription data from the TCGA consortium, the data repository, and use them as a reference or, or as a com comparison. And we know what end, uh, uh, for, for the tar uh, for the patients, uh, we are interested. What's end? And, I'm, I'm uh, people one, by the way. Uh, so okay. I'm, yeah, just to be clear, I'm the lowest row in that uh, um, in bar graph. Yeah, this is consistent with the uh, imaging data uh, Rick just showed, right? He's, uh, mm -hmm. In his slide, he said uh, zero to five percent is low end. It's like a cold tumor. And that is uh, another another uh, algorithm which also helps to deconvolute the cell composition just even lower. So uh, by this means that uh, we were no specific patients uh, that the, the what end they their their immune uh, cell uh, are in, and uh, also to validate the result because uh, I'm not very familiar with the algorithm so. I compare the expression quantile for those marker genes, for example, like a CD1, CD3. Those are the marker genes for specific uh, immune cell types. Uh, these are the kill killer cell markers. These are the inflammatory signals from the neutrophil, those kind of things. And for people one, you can see uh, this, uh, uh, 
this he uh, for 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 this is the people uh, actually Rick's Rick's expression values compared to their uh, signals is at almostly at the low end. For example, like uh, this yellow, except this yellow, this IL seven R, is like a high end, uh, nine. 90 percentile for others, mostly 10 percentile lower. So we just support the conclusion on these fractions at the low end. So that's how it works. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Any question? Or... I have a very basic question. I don't know what the word deconvolution means. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, it just means, uh, for example, you have uh, a soup. It's made of a tomato, uh, like a beef or a any kind of things. But uh, you want to know uh, after after you get the stool, everything is in the store. You know the molecule. Uh, uh, you know the, uh, the 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 abundance of the molecules. But you don't know uh, which contribute how much like those kind of ingredients to these molecules. So that's a uh, we try to use the uh, original composition in the in the in the in the fruit or in the beef or in, in the, uh, anything that you know what how much uh, beef you have input, how much tomato you have input. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so it's percentages of the total stew that is of each of the ingredients of the stew. Uh, Let's say in this in this in the stew you have the molecules. You want to know what uh, a part of uh, the beef or what a part of uh, tomato, what a uh, potato contribute those kind of molecules. Uh, so then eventually you will know how much potato you should put uh, uh, to begin with the uh, with, with the cook. How much beef you should uh, begin with the cook. Does that make sense? Okay. So then for this case, uh, because the different cells contribute different molecules, they, they share some molecules, but uh, eventually you will know how much cell populations uh, in that tissue, because you only know the molecules. So it sounds like a percentage. Yeah, yeah so percentage. it also sounds like you're reverse engineering it. You say, I'm, I'm doing this analysis of the stew and yeah. then I'm reverse engineering and saying, this must've been how much beef went into it. And this is how much tomato went exactly. into it. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So for it's these like the back of a package of, of food, like how much, what, you know, uh, how much percentage is, is carbs, sugars, it's a, that's exactly, right. exactly. That's yeah. the thing. Because, uh, yeah, just uh, because uh, the, the ultimate uh, made goal is to, to know how much cells we could work on because we work with, because for, for this tumor case, uh, if you want to use the immune therapy, you, you have to have some, uh, enough. Uh, T cells, then you want to know how much T for, for RNA seq data, you only have the molecule abundance, not really the cell abundance. So you want to reverse engineer to get the fraction of the T cells in that tissue. That's how it works. So another English word, again, I'm completely naive, but it would just sound like decomposition. So you're just breaking it down into the constituent parts that make up this thing. Yes. Kind okay. of like, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks, Wei. Uh, uh, if it's okay, I'll take over again. That is perfect. Sure. Mm -hmm. I hope I hope this is uh, interesting. Uh, so, from the, the result of, uh, and this is uh, some of Wei's work, um, there, and uh, this is one algorithm. Uh, and I'm, I'm currently uh, benefiting from Way shared his code with me. So I'm going through the different algorithms, comparing, I'm comparing uh, my data from both Ascion and Tempest. So I have two sets of data on the same, uh, my same, from my same tissue. So I'll be doing kind of like a, how does this make sense? So far, uh, it does. I have very low CD8. From this, from this algorithm, even lower than one on one of Way's slides. But basically the, the conclusion is I have pretty low uh, immune infiltration. 
And so uh, unleashing the immune state with, no, with nothing there is, you know, the interpretation, probably not a good candidate from this evidence for uh, immunotherapy on the pd one axis. Hey, Rick, I think this is the first time I've seen this. How does this compare to the um, work that was done at, uh, with Tempest? I, I still have to look. Okay. So, so we were given uh, a similar uh, mm -hmm. assessment from Tempest and I, I'm now just pulling it together. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, this, this should be coming, but this is one glimpse. And I think it's kind of interesting. And thank you so much, Way, for uh, uh, kind of like. Uh, I don't actually, there's uh, there's one thing I want to want to add uh, is that actually the tumor is kind of dynamic, you know, uh, which means because uh, which means this uh, cell composition could change. For example, I as I know that uh, in some uh, 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 radio, uh, what do you call that uh, radio. Uh, at uh, therapy, uh, they the um, they try to just like make the cold cold tumor hot, right? Uh, so that's a, another strategy to to increase the tumor. Uh, in the sorry, increase the lymph um, the, the immune uh, infiltration, and that's that could help the uh, the downstream uh, treatment uh, the uh, immunotherapy. That's another strategy I want to mention. Yeah. Yep. So hopefully, yeah, this, this data is from my naive primary tumor. And so hopefully it's a little better story on uh, my metastases. Okay. Yeah. I'm good. Uh, so we have only like 10 minutes left. So I'm, I'm going to kind of go a little fast, but I'll give you some glimpses of some slides to just to think, but the final slide will be, what do my doctors recommend given there, they uh, have seen a little bit of this uh, RNA-seq data, which most oncologists don't in ever interpret, but ours, Brian and I, uh, our care team has seen some of these results. So uh, here's one set of data that can be uh, one conclusion, and it's the immune deconvolution of the primary tumor that would help guide therapy. There's from RNA-seq data. Okay, uh, then just real quick, uh, what does RNA-seq data even look like? Here is uh, four public examples of melanoma where you have the gene names uh, and then the, the uh, relative abundance of these four, each column is a, is a patient and you have 22,000 rows roughly. And that's what the data looks like. And then there was uh, back in uh, 2019, 2018, CyberSword is one of the algorithms and it was published uh, um, and it, amazingly accurate. Like who would think it'd be that, that accurate? It, it is, uh, they're, they're pretty good. So this was the paper and here's the, uh, from the paper, you have this RNA profile from these different, this is like the uh, soup that Wei was talking about. These, these are the different cell types uh, in the soup and they have a profile and you put it in this matrix and this is the deconvolution matrix. Uh, and then we look at Brian and my RNA profile and you run this algorithm from this matrix and our data, you look at the significance and you come up with the proportions. So that's the basic of this deconvolution. I'm gonna go quick here because of the time. And then what does this matrix look like? Okay, here is LM22. This is a signature matrix. Uh, here we have genes and across uh, the columns are the different cell types. And I've sorted this uh, and colored it for uh, Basically, the algorithm is looking for these cell types and CD8 T cells are what kills the tumor. That's a, that's a particular of importance. And so you look at this blow up, you know, what is most predictive of uh, CD8 in the soup? And it's these genes in these orders, according to 
the signature matrix. And again, we see the granzyme, which is the kill, and uh, perforin, which is the kill of, of the, uh, that's the kill mechanism of a T cell. So it releases perforin, which perforates the, the tumor uh, membrane, and in goes grant, and it also releases granzymes that go in and start an, a kill of the, of the tumor. So this is what the matrix looks like. Um, I, I'm going to go pretty fast here because, uh, uh, and then the other, well, actually, is there any questions there? Do, I hope this was somewhat interesting or probably <laughs> no questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's fine. Anyway. That's... Hey, hey, Rick, I've, I've got a question. I'm sorry. Um, what I was on mute. Um, what are, what are the numbers? What do they represent? Is it trans uh, transcription? If you basically, and if, if this was just linear algebra concept, you would say this is the influence, these numbers, the, let's do it for CD8. Mm -hmm. this, this would say if how much IL-7 receptor mm -hmm. and down to these genes do I see in your RNA sequence? What is the relative abundance of these genes sure. and you multiply it by this influence factor? And that will tell you an estimate of the CD8 cells. So this is like, you look at our gene expression of these genes and uh, we, and if, what does our gene expression look like? It looks like any column of here, this is the relative abundance. So you take any, all of these columns, but one at a time, and you multiply the genes times this matrix, roughly speaking, mm -hmm. and you come up with your assessment. Uh, maybe I can help you to explain that a little bit. Okay. Uh, that, yeah. So I minutes. guess, <laughs> oh, sorry. So this, like, this, uh, this table uh, is just uh, the gene abundance, relative abundance of, uh, of, for these molecules. So you mm. can see that each columns are the cell types and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and each rows are the gene uh, IDs. Mm -hmm. So basically after the combination of the different the cell types uh, with different uh, percentage, you will get another list of gene expressions. So that's a, a, when we go, when we, you try to get back to those the cell type, the fraction of the cell types uh, and you need to perform deconvolution. Does that make sense? It's like a reverse engineering from, from the, because you already know each part, uh, each cell type has a certain yeah. molecule abundance. When mm -hmm. they combine in different mm -hmm. percentage, you will get another, the whole thing uh, mm -hmm. with different molecule abundance. Then you use these values to, to to uh, to calculate the, the fractions of those uh, cell types, that's Got how it, it works. Mm -hmm. So he he has sort of like a, uh, an overabundance of IL seven R um, uh -huh. in in CD eight in T cell CD eight. Uh, yeah, IL seven R is the T cell marker, so that's why it's uh, in T cells uh, is uh, abundance. So for this table, it's like a reference from okay. the from the from what well, convention from what most people measure about the these molecule in that cell types. Okay. Then later, when we get a real tissue, that you can reverse engineer to the to the uh, cell type population. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I got it. Thank you. So what we're doing is kind of comparing IHC staining with RNA seq staining, and we also want to compare spatial. Uh, and see if we get concordance of results. And then that would be very good evidence of hope to guide therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's another aspect to RNA-seq interpretation and you're looking for just bad actors. I mean, and these, or, or, or good actors, you're looking for what do you have overexpression of? And I have uh, actually the same uh, overexpression for these three. Uh, androgen receptor, PSMA, and B7H3. So this is, this is, if you're looking at, you know, B7H3 androgen receptor, they'll appear on this list and they'll have high numbers for Brian and I. And so 
relative to other prostate cancer patients in the uh, public data set and all cancer patients, it's been, uh, this is preliminary, but uh, I have very high expression, overexpression of these three uh, genes or these um, proteins. So why is that important? Because the, all, of, uh, all of these have uh, therapies that uh, we can direct. So this is very, this is one of the more encouraging. Okay, so uh, now out of all the 3,047 prostate clinical trials going on, and it doesn't have to be a clinical trial, but these are some of the combinations that we talked about that Brad brought up, uh, which do I pick? And so this is my last slide. And this is, uh, what's my next therapy? Uh, can we form a strategy? And what molecular testing might inform this? So this, you've seen the molecular testing that has been done on me. And this is my care team. This is a combination of recommendations to consider from Tanya Dorf, Raina McKay, and John Shen. Uh, all agree Pluvicto might be a great next step for me. Why? Because it targets PSMA and I have a ton of PSMA expression. In fact, PSMA expression uh, and androgen receptor, not only was I super high at my primary tumor after therapy tends to go higher. So this is uh, number one, and but unfortunately <laughs> due to production issues, it's not available, uh, according to Raina uh, McKay. It's, maybe it'll be available in six to eight weeks. So hopefully yeah. I just hang on docetaxel for a while. Notice the next one that Tanya Dorf recommended, the Olaparib cocktail, the, the triplet that uh, we discussed. Uh, also, because I have high expression of PSMA, um, the uh, Poseida and Caliber uh, clinical trials. And because I have super high androgen receptor, uh, this degrader, and um, a B7H3 clinical trial, uh, and then another uh, chemo. So my care team specifically included the uh, RNA seq data. And, and for my next steps, that would to totally not been, it's not typical that a prostate cancer patient get this data. And it's not typical that an oncologist would integrate it into their um, recommendations for next therapy. So we want to do more, but this is kind of, uh, I hope was a good glimpse at, uh, you know, at least my journey and my next steps, according to the my, my care team and I definitely want to stop and ask questions, open up for questions. There was a discussion in the uh, chat that we might just bring up. Chandra was mentioning that radiation uh, might be complementary to some of these treatments. And then Brian added, uh, in particular, complementary or could could pluvicto plus immunotherapy be a, a combination that might be useful? I can comment. Uh, I think a radiation is wonderful <laughs> if you can get targeted. Uh, um, I think there's a lot of evidence. So thank you, Chandra. I think there's a lot of evidence that it extends life. And so. Um, I, I would, and, and it's synergistic as well. Uh, so I'm hoping that'll be a consideration as well. Great, so, great. So what, what I was kind of like wondering, um, given that, you know, could you combine say a laparib with Plavicto and get the combined effect of essentially radiation, a radio ligand with, uh, and immunotherapy like a laparib. I think that's a great idea because they're both FDA approved. So I don't, 
maybe we should check to see if there are any clinical trials. I mean, Plavicto is so, I mean, well, lutetium has been around for a, a while. Um, it might be worth looking at uh, whether or not there are any clinical trials. That's a great suggestion. Trying to do, do you have you, any um, thoughts on that? I just want to clarify that the comment I put had uh, relates to more like the local uh, focused radiation you would get with the uh, Linux. So yeah. you heard about stereotactic uh, body radiation therapy, you might have got that already. But in lung cancers, like they're seeing that if you do that, like the really high dose, like maybe up to 10 gray per fraction, and then you interleave it with the immunotherapies, uh, there seems to be a really significant uh, response, synergistic response that they're seeing significant. And they're trying to figure out the timing right now, like whether immuno should go first or radiation should go first to prime the tumors. Uh, the same thing with prostate meds too, like if you have a few localized ones, I think that kind of treatment would work, would help. But if it's more diffuse, clearly like uh, it's not suitable. That's, yeah. Thanks. That's, that's great. Thank you, Chandra. And it, th these combinations are really interesting. Uh, th and we'll be picking that up uh, just to presage. Uh, is Bob Gatton be next week, Brian? Yeah. Yep. So that's this is something we should underline and remind uh, to bring up with him. Um, and maybe we could even, uh, you know, you should, Rick, you should be prepared with your list of drugs and we can talk about combinations of, of those uh, that that list you have uh, uh, in, in next week. We'll do.